He hadn't tried to sleep. Harry had a feeling that he wouldn't like what happened when he closed his eyes. He hadn't tried to read. He wouldn't have been able to focus. Funny how Harry's brain just seemed to keep on running and running, never shutting down no matter how tired it got. It got stupider, but it refused to switch off. But there was, there really and truly was, a feeling of triumph. Anti-Dark Lord Harry program, plus one point, didn't begin to cover it. No wonder Professor Quirrell had accused Harry of heading down the path of a Dark Lord. Harry had been too slow on the uptake. He should have seen the parallel right away. Understand that the Dark Lord did not win that day. His goal was to learn martial arts, and yet he left without a single lesson. Harry had entered the potions class with the intent to learn potions. He'd left without a single lesson. And Professor Quirrell had heard and understood with frightening precision and reached out and yanked Harry off that path, the path that led to his becoming a copy of You Know Who. There was a knock at the door. Classes are over. Harry approached the door and found himself suddenly nervous. Then the tension diminished as he heard Professor Quirrell's footsteps moving away from the door. What on earth is that about? Is it what's going to get him fired eventually? Harry opened the door and saw that Professor Quirrell was now waiting several body lengths away. Professor Quirrell, am I off the path to becoming a Dark Lord now? Mr. Potter, a word of advice. There is such a thing as a performance which is too perfect. Real people who have just been beaten and humiliated for fifteen minutes do not stand up and graciously forgive their enemies. It is the sort of thing you do when you're trying to convince everyone you're not dark. I can't believe this! You can't have every possible observation confirm your theory! And that was a trifle too much indignation. What on earth do I have to do to convince you? There is nothing you can do to convince me because I would know that was exactly what you were trying to do. And if we are to be even more precise, then while I suppose it is barely possible that perfectly good people exist even though I have never met one, it is nonetheless improbable that someone would be beaten for 15 minutes and then stand up and feel a great surge of kindly forgiveness for his attackers. On the other hand, it is less improbable that a young child would imagine this as the role to play in order to convince his teacher and classmates that he is not the next Dark Lord. The import of an act lies not in what that act resembles on the surface, Mr. Potter, but in the states of mind which make that act more or less probable. Harry blinked. He just had the dichotomy between the representativeness heuristic and the Bayesian definition of evidence explained to him by a wizard. Believe it or not, Mr. Potter, you need not fear me for having discovered your secret. I am not going to tell you to give up on becoming the next Dark Lord. If I could turn back the hands of time and somehow remove that ambition from the mind of my child self, the self of this present time would not benefit from the alteration. For as long as I thought that was my goal, it drove me to study and learn and refine myself and become stronger. Ask me to show you to the library section which holds those same books I read as a 13-year-old, and I will happily lead the way. Professor Quirrell, I think that what you're seeing is my mysterious dark side. It happens when I get angry. My blood runs cold, everything gets cold, everything seems perfectly clear. In retrospect, it's been with me for a while. In my first year of muggle school, someone tried to take away my ball during recess, and I held it behind my back and kicked him in the solar plexus, which I'd read was a weak point. And the other kids didn't bother me after that. And I bit a math teacher when she wouldn't accept my dominance. But it's only just recently that I've been under enough stress to notice that it's an actual, you know, mysterious dark side. And not just an anger management problem like the school psychologist said. And I don't have any super magical powers when it happens. That was one of the first things I checked. Professor Quirrell rubbed his nose. Well, I suppose there was something you could say that would convince me. I have already guessed that my dark side is really just another part of me, and that the answer isn't to never become angry, but to learn to stay in control by accepting it. Mr. Potter, if you truly do not wish to be the next Dark Lord, then what was the ambition which the Sorting Hat tried to convince you to abandon? The ambition for which you were sorted into Slytherin. I was sorted into Ravenclaw! Mr. Potter, I know you are accustomed to everyone around you being a fool, but please do not mistake me for one of them. The likelihood that the Sorting Hat would play its first prank in 800 years while it was upon your head is so small as to not be worth considering. But the most probable explanation is that Dumbledore decided he was not happy with the Hat's choice for the boy who lived. 
This is evident to anyone with the tiniest smidgen of common sense, so your secret is safe at Hogwarts. Professor Kroll was wrong, but wrong in such a convincing way that Harry was starting to think that it simply was the rational judgment giving the evidence available to Professor Quirrell. There were times when you would get improbable evidence and the best knowledgeable guess would be wrong. The Sorting Hat did seem to think I was going to end up as a Dark Lord unless I went to Hufflepuff. But I don't want to be one. Mr. Potter, don't take this the wrong way. I promise you will not be graded on the answer. I only want to know your own honest reply. Why not? Um, people would get hurt? Surely you've wanted to hurt people. Being a Dark Lord means that the people you want to get hurt get hurt. Just because I want to hurt someone doesn't mean it's right. What makes it right if not you're wanting it? In the end, people all do what they want to do. Sometimes people give names like right to things they want to do, but how could we possibly act on anything but our own desires? Well, obviously. I couldn't act on moral considerations if they lacked the power to move me. My parents took me in when my parents died because they were good people, and to become a Dark Lord is to betray that. So you are held back by the thought of your parents' disapproval. Does that mean that if they died in an accident, there would be nothing left to stop you from... No! Just no! It's their impulse to kindness which sheltered me. That impulse is not only in my parents, and that impulse is what would be betrayed. In any case, Mr. Potter, you have not answered my original question. What is your ambition? Oh, um... To understand everything important there is to know about the universe, apply that knowledge to become omnipotent, and use that power to rewrite reality, because I have some objections to the way it works now. Forgive me if this is a stupid question, Mr. Potter, but are you sure you did not just confess to wanting to be a Dark Lord? That's only if you use your power for evil. If you use the power for good, you're a Light Lord. I suppose I can work with that. But Mr. Potter, while the scope of your ambition is worthy of Salazar himself, how exactly do you propose to go about it? Is step one to become a great fighting wizard, or head unspeakable, or minister of magic, or... Step one is to become a scientist. Professor Quirrell was looking at Harry as if he'd just turned into a cat. A scientist. Yes, I shall achieve my objectives through the power of science. You're a fool, Harry Potter. May I strongly recommend that you try to become a Dark Lord instead? You don't like science. Why not? Those fool muggles will kill us all someday. They will end it. End all of it. What are we talking about here? Nuclear weapons? Yes, nuclear weapons! Even he who must not be named never used those, perhaps because he didn't want to rule over a heap of ash. The eager little fools who discovered the secret of nuclear weapons didn't keep it to themselves. They told their fool politicians, and now we must live under the constant threat of annihilation. There are secrets you do not share with anyone who lacks the intelligence and the discipline to discover them for themselves. I'll have to think about that. It's a new idea to me. Is there any sort of science you do approve of? Medicine, maybe? Space travel. But the muggles seem to be dragging their feet on the one project which might have let wizard kind escape this planet before they blow it up. I'm a big fan of the space program, too. At least we have that much in common. Professor Quirrell looked at Harry. Something flickered in the professor's eyes. I will have your word, your promise, and your oath never to speak of what follows. You have it. I will now cast a rare and powerful spell. Not on you, but on the classroom around us. Stand still so that you do not touch the boundaries of the spell once it has been cast. You must not interact with the magic which I am maintaining. Look only. Otherwise, I will end the spell and try not to fall over. Harry nodded, puzzled and anticipatory. Professor Kroll raised his wand and said something that Harry's ears and mind couldn't grasp at all. The walls and ceilings vanished. Harry stood on a small circle of white marble in the midst of an endless field of stars, burning terribly bright and unwavering. There was no earth, no moon, no sun that Harry recognized. The Milky Way was already visible as a great wash of light, and it grew brighter as Harry's vision adjusted to the darkness. The sight wrenched at Harry's heart like nothing he had ever seen. Are we... in space? 
No, but it is a true image. Tears came into Harry's eyes. He wiped them away frantically. He would not miss this for some stupid water blurring his vision. The stars were no longer tiny jewels set in a giant velvet dome as they were in the night sky of Earth. Here there was no sky above, no surrounding sphere. Only points of perfect light against perfect blackness. An infinite and empty void with countless tiny holes through which shone the brilliance from some unimaginable realm beyond. In space, the stars looked terribly, terribly, terribly far away. Harry kept on wiping his eyes over and over. Sometimes, when this flawed world seems unusually hateful, I wonder whether there might be some other place, far away, where I should have been. I cannot seem to imagine what that place might be, and if I can't even imagine it, then how can I believe it exists? And yet, the universe is so very, very wide, and perhaps it might exist anyway? But the stars are so very, very far away. It would take a long, long time to get there, even if I knew the way. And I wonder what I would dream about if I slept for a long, long time. Though it felt like sacrilege, Harry managed to whisper, Please let me stay here a while. Professor Quirrell nodded where he stood unsupported against the stars. It was easy to forget the small circle of marble on which you stood, and your own body, and become a point of awareness which might have been still or might have been moving. With all distances incalculable, there was no way to tell. There was a time of no time. And then the stars vanished, and the classroom returned. I'm sorry, but we're about to have company. It's fine. It was enough. He would never forget this day, and not because of the unimportant things which had happened earlier. He would learn how to cast that spell if it was the last thing he ever learned. Quirinus! How dare you! It was... Dumbledore. I heard students saying that this man had you abused by older Slytherins, that he forbade you to defend yourself. Professor Quirrell did the right thing. He knew exactly what was wrong with me, and he showed me how to fix it. Slowly, Dumbledore's expression changed from something that would vaporize steel into something merely angry. Harry, what are you talking about? I was teaching him how to lose. It's an important life skill. It was apparent that Dumbledore still didn't understand, but his voice had lowered in register. Harry, if there is any threat the defense professor has offered you to prevent you from complaining... Headmaster, what's wrong with me isn't that I keep quiet about abusive professors. Professor Quirrell chuckled. Not perfect, Mr. Potter, but good enough for your first day. Headmaster, did you stay long enough to hear about the 51 points for Ravenclaw, or did you storm out as soon as you heard the first part? He wasn't expecting them, but it seemed appropriate. Tell Professor McGonagall that I think the story of what Mr. Potter went through to earn back the lost points will do just as well to make her point. No, Headmaster, Mr. Potter didn't tell me anything. It's easy to see which part of today's events are her work, just as I know that the final compromise was your own suggestion. Though I wonder how on earth Mr. Potter was able to gain the upper hand on both Snape and you and then Professor McGonagall was able to gain the upper hand over him. Somehow, Harry managed to control his face. Was it that obvious to a real Slytherin? Your color looks a little off, Harry. What did you have for lunch today? Why would Dumbledore be asking about deep-fried lamb and thin-sliced broccoli when that was just about the last probable cause of... Never mind, then. I think you'll be fine. If you don't tell him, then I will even if you fire me for it. Dumbledore sighed and turned back to Harry. I apologize for invading your mental privacy, Mr. Potter. I had no purpose except to determine if Professor Quirrell had done the same. Legitimacy is sometimes mistaken for common sense, but it leaves traces which another skillful legilimens can detect. That was all I looked for, Mr. Potter and I asked you an irrelevant question to ensure you would not be thinking about anything important while I looked. You! 
You should have asked first! No, Mr. Potter. The headmaster had some justification for his concerns. And had he asked for permission to see, you would have thought of exactly those things you did not wish him to see. I am rather more concerned, headmaster, that you saw no need to tell him afterward. You have now made it more difficult to confirm his mental privacy on future occasions. Was that your intention, I wonder? There are too many legilimens in this school. I insist that Mr. Potter receive instruction in occlumency. Mr. Potter will ask his account manager at Gringotts to recommend a neutral instructor. With respect, Headmaster Dumbledore, after the events of this morning, I must protest you or your friends having access to Mr. Potter's mind. I must also insist that the instructor have taken an unbreakable vow to reveal nothing, and that he agree to be obliviated of each session immediately afterward. Such services are extremely expensive, as you well know, and I cannot help but wonder why you deem them necessary. If it's money that's the problem, I have some ideas for making large amounts of money quickly. Thank you, Quirinus. Your wisdom is now quite evident, and I am sorry for disputing it. Your concern for Harry Potter does you credit as well. You're welcome. I hope you will not object if I go on making him a particular focus of my attentions. It is my own wish also. Harry, you must realize that if you choose this man as your teacher and your friend, your first mentor, then one way or another you will lose him. Probably, but he will have the full use of me while I last. I suppose it is economical, at least, since as the defense professor, you're already doomed in some unknown fashion. I will inform Madame Pince that Mr. Potter is allowed to obtain books on occlumency. There is preliminary training which you must do on your own, and I do suggest that you hurry up on it. I'll take my leave of you then. He nodded to both Harry and Professor Quirrell, then departed, walking a bit slowly. Can you cast the spell again? Not today. And not tomorrow either, I'm afraid. It takes a lot out of me to cast, though less to keep going, and so I usually prefer to maintain it as long as possible. This time I cast it on impulse. Had I thought, and realized we might be interrupted... Dumbledore was now Harry's least favorite person in the entire world. Even if I only ever see it once, I will never stop being grateful to you. Professor Quirrell nodded. Have you heard of the Pioneer Program? They were probes that would fly by different planets and take pictures. Two of the probes would end up on trajectories that took them out of the solar system and into interstellar space. So they put a golden plaque on the probes with a picture of a man and a woman and showing where to find our sun in the galaxy. Professor Quirrell was silent for a moment, then smiled. Tell me, Mr. Potter, can you guess what thought went through my mind when I finished assembling the 37 items on the list of things I would never do as a Dark Lord? Put yourself in my shoes. And guess. You decided that if you had to follow the whole list all the time, there wouldn't be much point in becoming a Dark Lord in the first place. Precisely. So, I am going to violate Rule 2, which was simply, don't brag, and tell you about something I have done. I subscribe to a Muggle Bulletin which keeps me informed of progress on space travel. I didn't hear about Pioneer 10 until they reported its launch, but when I discovered that Pioneer 11 would also be leaving the solar system forever, I snuck into NASA. I did, and I cast a lovely little spell on that lovely golden plaque which would make it last a lot longer than it otherwise would. Yes. I thought that was how you might react. I can't think of anything to say. You win, seems appropriate. You win! See? We can only imagine what giant heap of trouble you would have gotten into if you had been unable to say that. They both laughed. You didn't add any extra information to the plaque, did you? Extra information? Maybe you included a holographic message like in Star Wars? Or... Hmm... A portrait seems to store a whole human brain's worth of information. You couldn't have added any extra mass to the probe, but maybe you could have turned an existing part into a portrait of yourself? Or you found a volunteer dying of a terminal illness, snuck them into NASA, and cast a spell to make sure their ghost ended up on the plaque. Mr. Potter, a spell requiring a human death would certainly be classified by the Ministry as dark arts, regardless of circumstances. 
Students should not be heard talking about such things. And the amazing thing about the way Professor Quirrell said it was how perfectly it maintained plausible deniability. It had been said in exactly the appropriate tone for someone who wasn't willing to discuss such things and thought students should steer away from them. Got it. I won't talk with anyone else about that idea. Please be discreet about the whole matter, Mr. Potter. I prefer to go through my life without attracting public notice. You will find nothing in the newspapers about Quirinus Quirrell until I decided it was time for me to teach defense at Hogwarts. So just how much awesome stuff have you done that no one else knows about? Oh, some. But I think that's quite enough for today, Mr. Potter. I confess, I am feeling a bit tired. I understand. And thank you. For everything. Harry quickly took his leave.